Good evening. Good evening. So that was really fun. That was really fun. People should know that in the pre-show, I dropped <laughs> a bit of information on my brother Anthony. That's even that we can't talk about it during the show. No. But I think I threw him for a loop. Yeah. <clears throat> that was really like uh pretty jarring. <laughs> private family business i mean it's not like it's bad news or anything no, it's just it's not, no bad news for anybody just something that made just one happen. of those things we were like holy really moly. really that's true and it's showtime yes but i need i need your help with something uh I'm, happy to I'm, happy to be there for you I'm what can i do uh well uh mom got her second dose of the vaccine now and right. she's already making plans like you know two weeks from now she's okay and she there's like clubs she wants to hit yeah we're, we're gonna have to tie her down she is uh I, I think she's deserving of going to any clubs she wants to go to she's gonna go back to her same old crazy ways though oh you crazy know? barbara yeah no not crazy barbara crazy, crazy bath <laughs> um nuts. i think she's uh She's do a little crazy if she wants to. Everybody's been locked down for a year. Everybody wants to go do stuff. You're just jealous because you haven't gotten your shot yet. I haven't gotten my shot yet. You'd oh, be doing wow. table service at some crazy downtown bar. If... That's true. That's true. The other thing that's going on is, uh, you know, if this, if we weren't dropping this as a podcast, I'd say we need to take a moment of silence uh, for the passing of a great American today. Or a horrible American, depending on how politically correct we wanted to be want to be let's say a great champion of the first amendment not so much for women's rights i'm uh, please forgive me have not been looking at the news today what happened larry flint passed away oh larry flint died so, huh. no, it's you, 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 uh, wow. but but an event needs to be recognized notable a notable, notable event historical, for sure a historical figure yeah uh, for some a hero for some a hero and for some not. For some uh, despicable uh, person. But I understand. Uh, but a type I understand. of commerce. A, a businessman. And a, and a nice big office building in in uh, Beverly Hills. He's no Bob Guccione, but he's great. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So a toast to you, Mr. Flint. Mr. Flint. Ah. Um, and, uh, you know, no, uh, I, I think it's odd. Uh, it's an interesting tie in actually that Larry Flint died today. And we're, uh, talking about a movie today that starred James Coburn, right? Who did, played our man Flint. He did. The so, our man Flint movies. This was a uh, out like Flint, out I guess. Like, yes. Out like Flint. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's cold. Okay. So our movie this week, The President's Analyst. You're not going to tell me how you are? It's just Larry Flint oh, and that's gonna, it. We're going to go, go. We want personal stuff. I'm, I mean, I'm, I can't. I, I've got to. I have to have some chit chat. I'm good. I'm ha I'm wearing a hat, a new hat that I got. In I love I love the hat. Friend Joe. Just did it. Friend Joe. Yeah. We Great again. Did. Um, uh, for those of you on uh, the pot listening to this on the podcast, my hat says we just did 46. So it's our our retort to the hats of the past four years. It's nice to have a different uh, different look. Yeah. I've also, you know, since I've lost almost all the hair on the top of my head, I've I've recently realized uh, I realized last summer that I have to wear a hat now all the time when I'm outside. In yeah. You get some sunburns on your head. I got my first head sunburn ever last summer. That is, that's a different kind of sunburn. Does it hurt? Burned. It hurts more than uh, other parts of your body. Yeah. That got burned. Yeah. What's the, what's the most sensitive thing that ever, that you ever burn? The top of my head. Is it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. No, so I you don't have anything to gauge it against. <laughs> But it was pretty shoulders. painful. Shoulders are the other things I burn. Shoulders, but everybody burns yeah. their shoulders. Yeah. So who cares? You know. How are you? I'm What's good. I'm fine. Life? Um, uh, much the same. Uh, uh, 
don't have anything exciting to say. Been doing some cooking around the house. Well, actually, only in the kitchen. But uh, <laughs> I've been doing stuff around the house and cooking some some nice things. And uh, I'm getting a little crazy in the winter lockdown portion of lockdown. Well, we've had more snow the past. More than most years in the past, past 10 years. I've, I've done more shoveling in the past eight days than I've done in the previous 40 years. Shoveling makes your back feel great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, luckily, we don't have any of that. So we're we're fortunate not to have to shovel anything because yeah. we're in the city. But um, but just I'm getting a little stir crazy. It's a little Overlook Hotel up in the old noggin. Oh, yeah. Well, just a little bit like, you know, I'd like to I'd like to go for a drive. I I just like to do almost anything. Yeah, I get it. You know, and uh, I'm not saying that other people though. I'm not special. But you asked how I was. That's how I am. I'm a little stir crazy. Well, I am going to be bringing you a very good bottle of booze in a couple of weeks. That's exciting. As soon as we get our uh, the new batch of our flavor from uh, our flavor. A couple of weeks. Do we, have, do we have a date, an actual date? Or you're just going to say. I, I will get the flavor in about uh, a week and a half, two weeks. And then I have to blend everything, which is easy. That's quick. But um, there's a bathtub at the place. Don't need a bathtub. I have a bottling bucket coming from a homebrew supply company. Yeah. And I have a whole, I have 36 sample bottles here uh, to fill. So got a few, you know. Well, I'm honored that I'm among the people that get to have a sample. It's coming together. Um, you let me know if there's any investments that might happen in 20 years when I have some money to invest. Yeah. No, by then, uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have sold the company by then. And uh, and uh, then uh, you'll just come visit me on my small island that I'm going to buy. I'll be taking. I'll take care of your small island, so, or and, be, and no, out of your way completely. Just I'll be completely quiet. Because Bruce, Mark, and I plan on you know riding Vespas around Lake Como with uh, with, with George, George, and, uh, Randy. Yeah. Uh, Is it Randy, his partner. Randy, somebody. I don't know. It's uh, George's partner. I think we're we're in, entering litigation territory, so I don't know probably, what to probably. say. Okay. Well, then we. <laughs> 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 so I think we better start talking about the movie. Okay. Or or we could just say, and that's our show, ladies and gentlemen. No, you know, I've actually been dying to talk about this movie. Yeah, me too. There's dying to talk about it. So, what is the movie? Uh, the movie we're talking about this week is The President's Analyst from 1967. Um, it is directed by and written by a man named Theodore J. Flicker, which is the greatest name for a movie director. It's a great name, Ted Flicker. Hey, Ted Flicker. Yeah, Ted Flicker. Um, and it stars James Coburn and a gallery of fascinating and interesting character, comedian, actors, uh, notably Godfrey Cambridge, um, Severed Arden, who pop worked with back in the day yeah uh, one of my favorite here it's now pat harrington jr from <laughs> television fame yeah uh who else will gear three, uh, three's company uh pat harrington uh, was um was it three's company or one day at a time one day at a time oh okay yeah he was yeah. the handyman on, right. on one day at a time very young in this movie very young and handsome very young and handsome yeah. uh and uh it is uh so it's it's a uh, it's a bit hard to describe but it it's it's about uh, a man who is a very you know popular uh, analyst psychoanalyst who lives in new york city um very kind of straight arrow guy played by james coburn who's been chosen and groomed unbeknownst to him to become the analyst for the president of the united states Who's having a lot? Who's under a lot of pressure and needs someone to talk to? Well, so, you know, as as you would, as you would, leader of the free world. So he gets vetted by a client who he who he um, doesn't know is working for the CIA or what they call the C CEA yeah. in this movie. Very cleverly disguised. Yeah, 
Um, and uh, they he he gets the go ahead to do it, and they 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 bring him and his girlfriend to Washington, where he starts to work with the president, and he becomes very paranoid because uh, he learns things he's that make him uncomfortable about the state of the world. Yep. And um, he uh, he takes flight, and the, the movie is about American family. I mean, believe it or not, that's kind of just the setup. And then the rest of the movie, the yeah. movie is about trying to get him and find him and all these different people trying to get him. So it's this kind of crazy. Um, it's kind of like, how do you describe it? Like uh, a mad, 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 mad world meets James Bond meets, you it's know, a hard day's night. it's a hard day's night. Yeah. yeah. meets the it's swing in 60s. Very 60s, nutty. Crazy. But, but like from that crazy. Hollywood perspective where they weren't really hippies, they no. were, they thought they knew what hippies were. So they no. were pretending to, to understand the counterculture. And um, anyway, this is, I, the only thing I'm going to to lead with is that I'm just really, I'm kind of sorry that Peter Sellers was clearly busy making another film. Yes. He was making the magic Christian. <laughs> and I'm also, alternately sorry that uh, that dad wasn't available either or hadn't yeah. was busy making Russians are coming because he, I I was I kept on thinking of both of them throughout this movie because I I think it would be a, a a famous film if somebody else had starred in it not not to denigrate Coburn okay. but I think he was making a uh, wait until dark when this movie was being made okay that would make sense. Yeah. I, I know that, that this was, you, you can tell that this was shot later than the Russians are coming because there's somebody in this movie who is older than he was <laughs> in the Russians are coming. So I was right about that, that little kid, right? Well, hold on one second here. Kinds of boats. Yes. Yeah. They're Russian. Uh -huh. A nice little boy. There, sir. <laughs> Which one? Uh, it's that Collins. that's him i knew it was him i just uh oh, i may be like 99 percent sure but he was just old older enough in this to, just, to make yeah. me think maybe i was wrong but it's I, the voice the, the, the moment he started speaking i said holy shit yeah the kid from the rest yeah show. incredible he also has the great line where he says I bet something to the effect of, I bet I'm the only kid in my preschool whose dad's a, a you know, a, a, a traitor with the Russians or a, an Arnold Bennett. Yeah, he talks he, back. Yeah. Bennett is Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> he talks back to Carl Reiner. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean. He's dynamite. He's great. So, I mean, um, there's there, there's so many. I mean, I had a great time watching this movie. I had, I really did have a good time. It's a, it's a kind of, it, it's got some problems. Yeah. But, but I would see it again. And I, I would see there, it again. There are sequences I, I would, I would show people, I would like definitely see over and over again. There is one sequence in this movie that I think is spectacular. Just a, an amazing, and it almost doesn't belong in this movie. Um, but I think it's a brilliant little piece of filmmaking. Uh, there are, there are, um, well, I don't know if we're thinking of the same s section. There's a section of the movie that I think is bro, just absolutely brilliant. And I, and I, I can't believe it's not more discussed and more talked about because I, I will bet you $10 right now. We're thinking of the same scene. It, it happens in the write first 10, 15 minutes of the movie, write it down on a piece of paper and we'll, we'll show them. No, it, uh, it's, it's let's say it at the same time. Okay. One, yes. two, three. Godfrey, Godfrey Cambridge is monologue, right, in, monologue the, in the, yeah. See, we picked out the same exact thing. I didn't, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I literally couldn't believe how exciting this, and it, it, he's incredible. And the filmmaking around it is filmmaking incredible. Is yeah. I, I was blown I have away. Pictures. I, I, I took pictures of those two camera angles mm -hmm. um, so that we can. Oh, uh, good, good. Yeah. Oh my God, that that's, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, I guess my biggest complaint about the movie is that 
it doesn't live up to that promise because that opening that sequence promises a movie that that almost promises like a stanley kubrick movie or something yeah. that promises something truly exceptional and the movie is fun and it's got great stuff in it and it never really i don't think lives up to that first 10 minutes and that scene right well the first shot the the shot starts with this this oh angle, god yeah where godfrey cambridge sits down to tell this amazing story about when he first heard the n-word uh, except this movie was made in 1967, so he is saying the N word. He's he's yeah. It's it's Probably a when he discovered that he that that's what he was, or that's and what they were. That's what people in his town were calling him yeah. and thought of him. And and, and it um starts out with this angle and then shifts to that angle. The camera moves and he's all alone in the room because the ther because James yeah. Coburn is the therapist is behind him and you don't see him at all and it's as if he's all alone telling the story and it's and then after the yeah. story they cut around to the reverse and you see the reflection of his severed head in on the table in front of him he's his head's been split open by the psychoanalysis what you go back and see it that after he t finishes telling the story and the camera cuts to Coburn and then cuts to Coburn's yeah. POV, which is around the other side of him. Right. You can see out the window that he's looking out at. Yeah. And the table has got like a mirrored surface on it. Oh, so his. So you see him and then you see the reflection of his head on the table in front right. of you. And it looks like kind of like his severed head has been psych like removed oh, and put on the table. God, I didn't even notice that. Oh my yeah. God. It, that it, really it's brilliant. Wow. Okay. So we're on the same page with that. Cause that I, my jaw was on the floor. I, I couldn't, I couldn't once in a while <clears throat> I'll see a movie and this is a prime example. I'd never heard of this movie before. And I've heard of a lot of movies. I mean, I've seen a lot of movies. I've heard of a lot of films, you right. know, so not to have even heard of this was weird and then to to have a sequence that was that that would be daring by today's standards you know uh and powerful and moving in this comedy this crazy comedy it was so uh it was really subversive and and powerful i couldn't yeah. believe i didn't know about it yeah it's a great great scene um Another, another little strange fun um, fact is that uh, Joan Darling, who is m married to uh, William William uh, Dan Bill Daniels, who's so great, dances great. great. Do you know Joan Darling? Do you know who that is? I uh, was she in the Babysitters? She would no. She was married to Eric Darling, who was in the Terriers with Dad. Okay. Okay. He, that's he, why the he, name he was, was familiar. The uh, banjo player in the Terriers with with Dad. Yeah, for anybody who's listening to this, doesn't know our pop started out um, as a musician. I mean, he he wanted to be an actor, but he he was only getting work playing guitar and stuff. So he he was in a folk trio in the fifties when folk music was like really hot. Yeah, and um, called the Terriers and. Uh, they that actually they travel debut in a movie called Calypso Heatwave. That's correct. With it's Annette Joel Funicello, Gray. right? No, not Annette Funicello, but Joel Gray is in it. I think Sylvia Miles might be in it. Okay. And, and um, Maya Angelou is in it. That's right. That's right. Maya Angelou's in that movie. I forgot that. And it's called Calypso Heatwave. Yeah. And I don't know where you can see it, but you can see the previews for it on, on YouTube. Yeah, I've seen the I've like seen those terrible. previews. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, really amazing. And Bet Bowles uh it says that Sheldon Collins, who's she's right, the kid is Sheldon Collins. Um he is now a successful <laughs> empress, apparently. Well, good for him. He has yeah. some sense. Yeah, he got out of this crazy. He thing. left because otherwise he'd be sitting around drinking scotch and doing a YouTube show with his brother. He's in a couple of hits, great films, and then he left. Yeah, didn't hang around to be in all those questionable titles. Yeah, get out of Dodge. Yeah. <laughs> um. So 
what do we want to start with? Do you want to talk about some favorite lines? Um, do you want to talk about social weirdness? Do you I want, want to talk about why? For, first, I want to talk about, to me, what the elephant in the room is. Uh, I don't think, I can't think of a better example of a movie that is sadly brought down by miscasting of a lead role as heavily as this film is. Um, I think that in my experience, I've only been this confused once before. <laughs> and it's in a film called <laughs> The Happening, directed by M. Night Shyamalan. And in that movie, they're asking me to believe that Mark Wahlberg is a school teacher. <laughs> okay. Hello. And I was very confused during that movie, uh, feeling that I was missing something, that I didn't understand either what a school teacher was or... Something was confusing, but um, uh, I felt similarly about Coburn being an, a New York analyst. I was, I didn't know, I, I felt like there must have been a miscommunication, like literally a bad, like a bad phone connection Yeah, from New York to LA or something, because yeah. can you think, other than Clint Eastwood, I can't think of a less likely analyst personally. <laughs> this, this guy? Yeah, no, it 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 did not work. And I like Coburn. Coburn's great Western actor. He's great for the kinds of stuff he's famous for. He never really did comedies, and now we can see why. And sadly, you, he's trying, he is but trying. he he missteps the comedy terrain. I think as 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 uh, as inelegantly as you can. Yeah. I think he. I think it. And I think this movie could have been like truly, truly famous and memorable if they had kept, if they had lured in a star who had um, real comedy chops. Well, can you imagine, I mean, even Jack Lemmon in this movie, I mean, somebody who, who could sell being afraid, <laughs> you, you know? Yeah. Um, did you not enjoy though the, um, the walk through after after he discovers that he's going to be the president's analyst and somebody the says, beatnik hey, hippie walk back. i'll give you a ride back to the office yeah. his his mentor who for some inexplicable reason is colonel sanders um, loved it will will gear looking exactly looking and dressing exactly like colonel sanders is his mentor and they they have this um, chat while they're walking through. Was it the Whitney? Whitney Museum. They're, they're walking through the Whitney, looking at art, and they one of my favorite scenes. Psychoanalysis, and then and then Will Gear says, "Can I give you a ride back to the office?" And he says, "No, I I think I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna walk." And he had there's this long sequence of him walking through New York. Um, a walking tour of New York to the the Statue of Liberty to the top of the Empire State Building, while Lalo Schifrin's score plays "Joy to the World." Then should all acquaintance be forgot? Then dashing through the snow, even though it's not winter or Christmas time, and back to "Joy to the World." Inexplicably mixing those three songs. It together. is a kaleidoscope of of beatnik hip, hippie strangeness. And then he gets home and he's in bed with and making out with uh, his girlfriend, played by the wonderful Joan Delaney, who was never seen before or since. Yeah, I couldn't. I I could not place her. Yeah, no, I really couldn't place her. Um, yeah, that was a great sequence. I miss, you know, I miss uh, stuff like that. I you mean, I really do like that little because they were on acid. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's of its time. It's totally, it's totally ridiculous. I mean, but I, I always enjoy those little, those little musical breaks they would put in. There's a few of them because he hooks up with hip with literally a, a group of hippies when he goes on the run. I don't, I don't want to talk about that whole sequence. It's too triggering I, for you. I, I had a total PTSD flashback to my childhood of 1967. <laughs> When uh, it, it was that was too much like a a four month a, a I four you. month period of my life that we can't talk about. Okay, I, I hear you. I mean, I've been you know, yeah, I've been around some of that hippie stuff myself, and I, it's a limited appeal sometimes. Disturbing. 
And um, I saw this movie when I was seven when it came out. Oh, you did? Do you, how well did you remember it? Seven, uh, well, not at all. Okay. Not at all. I remember thinking I was. It was really cool. I was seeing a very grown up movie. Do you remember anything about how it was perceived by the adults or how? What it like? Did people talk about this movie or was it like no. a midnight showing somewhere and no one? I think I saw it because Coburn was a hero of mine because of our man Flint. Okay. Which is essentially American James Bond, kind of B grade James Bond. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you didn't really say anything when I was talking about, Co you know, Coburn's comedic performance here. Are you in, are you saying that, uh, I you feel that he was well cast in this movie? No, no. Here's why I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything because you're you're absolutely right, but he was so bad in it that I didn't even conceive of it as a comedic role. I thought they were looking for kind of a straight guy to okay. do what he was doing. So what you're saying is if you're that bad, you end up getting points for it. That They were then building this movie around a guy who is just that that guy, that that's how they conceived of it. And that I, everything I, else, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not defending that point of view. I'm just saying I'm, that I'm, I'm, it didn't even occur to me that you would put somebody funny in that role because are you serious? Else, really? Oh, yeah, okay. Everything else was so wacky around it. I thought of him as like the, the, the straight guy. No, I don't, I don't mean that you needed, you know, I mean, Shecky green in the part. I mean, <laughs> I mean, a brilliant I mean, somebody with a sense of humor playing the straight yeah. guy. Yeah, I mean, like dad good. in the in-laws. I mean, it needed yeah. the dentist who's exactly. like, I'm just a dentist. I don't. And, exactly. and Coburn and Coburn has to be paranoid and terrified for his life through a lot of it. And he, he doesn't know how to do that in any way that was believably funny at all. No, and, you know, right. and, and you You're think right. of like, uh, I mean, even Woody Allen almost made movies like, you know, like you'd see him in this. Like, it's not. It, it, well, and you know what's odd about that? Uh, the point that you're making there is that Howard Koch, who produced this, also produced Plaza Suite, A New Leaf. Mm, yeah. The Odd Couple. Yeah. And Last of the Red Hot Lovers. Oh, uh, I, I didn't know yeah. this, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, like all that. Movie, all movies that have a, a character that you're talking about. Yeah. Played brilliantly by uh, uh, A New Leaf was. Uh, Walter uh, Matthau. Uh, Walter Matthau. Plaza Suite, I think, was Matthau, right? And a few other people, because yeah. I think that, yeah. Um, the Odd Couple had some talented people in it. Mm hmm. Last they of the Red Hot did. Lovers. Yeah. Pop in it. Um, but they they all had that kind of like you know the world around us has gone mad i'm you know but i'm the sensible one it's a classic new york paranoia comedy yeah stuff so, and and ted flicker i think wrote a great comedy script i think the script is amazing and inventive and like reminds you of kurt vonnegut you know and and you know yeah. uh, like a lot of interesting funny satirical elements it it degenerates into into kind of slapstick in moments, and the filmmaking isn't really tight there. No. So the gags don't really work that well. The fight, the shootouts, which are supposed to be kind of funny, don't aren't really funny or well staged. No. The sets aren't great, but that being said, there's ideas in this movie that are so ahead of its time. I mean, yeah. there there's like a sci-fi element to it as well. Yep. The thing that with, with Harrington at the with, end. Yeah, I mean that is that is like that's Doctor Strange Love level, like uh, you know, um, commenting on on corporate America and stuff very early. Yep, and it's really a hip movie. I gotta say, like, it's pretty hip for a studio movie back then, and pretty subversive. Yes. Uh, I mean, especially starting with that monologue we love so much. That yeah. I mean, that is a subversive thing to do in a movie. Um, and probably, you know what? I bet you anything, knowing our our world and country, that that maybe that scene 
turn people off at that time. Maybe like, there was something about opening the film that way with such a frank, uh, frank and, and condemnation by a, a black man of of his society and a black man in total power. Like he, this guy's a powerful figure. He's, yeah, you know, he's got a great job. He makes more money than the analyst. Like he's, he's just uh, telling truth that in 1967, I don't know if people were ready to hear or wanted to hear that in a major Hollywood movie. Yeah. Um, favorite lines favorite lines uh, when when uh, Godfrey Cambridge admits to, to Coburn in that therapy scene that he had just killed somebody and then come to his therapy session and he's allowed to kill people because he's a member of the CEA which is uh, obviously actually the CIA and 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 Coburn is not horrified. He's fascinated. And he says, he says, you can vent your aggressive feelings by actually killing people. It's a sensational solution to the hostility problem. <laughs> 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 I love that. And then I also love when the when the FBR agent shows up at William Daniels' house to kill um to kill Coburn and <laughs> And Sheldon Collins says, you going to kill Dr. Schaefer? And the agent says, yes, son. And Sheldon Collins says, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then later, um, uh, William Godfrey says to Severn Darden, shall we rescue our doctor? And Severn says, yeah, if I don't resume my analysis pretty soon, I'm going to flip out. That was my favorite line. <laughs> that was what I had written down. <laughs> kill me. Absolutely kill me. <laughs> or it might have been the other way around because they were both in, in therapy with him. Oh, it was um, funny. There's uh, there's there's one thing I want to do, which, uh, and we're going to have a momentary pause before I do it because we're going to edit this out of the podcast because i'm going to show a bunch of photographs oh okay but we are not going to show them in the podcast because it's all a right podcast. we could describe them uh with poetic with detail detail do you want to try and do that well you can always edit it out if it doesn't edit come out, out right it doesn't work okay here we go i have a i have a whole big um uh thing of of photographs that that i want to talk about and anyway why deny bet you know she's she's sitting there waiting for to see yeah. pictures. Well, she's going to see the pictures, but we might edit it out of the podcast. So here we go. Here are the photographs that I want to talk about. Um, and uh, actually, but before we do that, I'm going to ask mom to please put her earphones on because I'm hearing the show three or four seconds behind us, and it's really really distracting. But here are the photographs. The first one I call banana analysis. Um, <laughs> and he's, he's doing his first analysis session with Severn with a banana in his hand and yeah. then making that face. So I yeah. think that is, uh, for those of you in the, in the podcast <laughs> audience, our shrink is holding a peeled banana and doing something with his tongue in his mouth that people do when they're describing an inappropriate act um or an appropriate <laughs> act depending on the it's all about the timing on that yeah. i think the place uh, the time and place here's the picture of colonel sanders uh <clears throat> the analyst for the analyst by the way i think i know why he's dressed as colonel sanders why why there's a there's a lot of pun there's a lot of puns in this movie with names yeah. and stuff i think because right. he is cuckoo oh Oh, okay. And do you know why the guy is named Mr. Lux, for instance? Yes, right. right. Lux was a was a uh, the head of the FBR is Lux, which was a popular brand of vacuum cleaner, as was Hoover, who was the head of the FBI. Did you know, trivia wise, that the um, when they shot the movie, they were saying FBI and CIA. And then weren't given permission to use those, so they had to dub 
every reference. Every one. And they did a, I think they did a bad job on purpose because right. there's a few just honkingly clear bad ADRs where it's the room tone just changes up completely. Then we have the sequence where William Daniels is showing James Coburn the house that the traditional American family. What lives he, that's my, I love that line. He says, Build. do you like it? She decorated herself. That's and great. This is the house. But he has another comment. <laughs> it's so great, the decor. He's got another comment about sound because he has his whole house wired for sound. Oh, and he has he has this thing where he says, uh, true, what is it? True total, sound. Total oh, sound. Total sound. Yeah. And he says it in his car because he's got like a tape cassette yeah. player. Yeah. Total <clears throat> sound. So it's the, that, the early uh, version of surround sound. And then I, we can yeah. blow by these. I had the, the pictures of Godfrey Cambridge in the therapy session, which were amazing. Then I love this. They keep ending up having conversations in front of Hasid Has clothes. Has clothes. I know. Before Canal Street. Um, great, great set they keep coming or location they keep coming back to. This shot of the uh the uh FBR agents going nuts at the the acid party. Um that's a pretty funny acid party. That is I mean a very funny acid it's a pretty party. good 60s acid party. Yeah so the FBR agents with horns on their heads um, this is Godfrey Cambridge and Seven Darden as men of action. Which I get if you asked either of them, they probably would have said, Not probably gonna happen in my career and, that I will and those play a man of action. Rid ridiculous costumes with the hand grenades hanging, hanging brilliant off them. This is great. Um, and what else do I have? Oh, this is where I had a PTSD flashback because that's actually what about um that's what fall of 1967 looked like for me when you were being born mm. and I was, I mean, that's not where I was. I wasn't, I was born in a hospital. Born, no. It was a normal birth, but I was okay. off in California living with um, my birth mother and her 17th husband. They were creative uh, types. They were creative traveling around Northern California, looking for a commune to live in. So I think, I think this is actually documentary footage. Um, and then it's, it's James Coburn's out That's, uh, the pants, the, the, the pants that you want. Yeah. The pants and the belt. I want That's what you want. want. It's five inches wide. And, uh, that's uh, great. And then this the soup. Paranoia, the light got... coming out of the soup. Okay. We have to set this up for those of you who are, are, can't see this or whatever. Don't know what the hell this is. If you're watching, uh, Coburn is on call for the president at all times, day or night, 24 hours a day. He doesn't realize that's the job parameters, but when he gets to Washington, that's what they say. So <clears throat> he has to leave home when he's in bed, you know, in bed with his wife or half dressed. He's just got to drop stuff and run. And there's this light that signals him to go to the president's aid and, uh, he actually goes to a restaurant and the light is somehow signaling him from the, his bowl of soup, which of soup. I, I absolutely love. Nothing could prove more, for instance, that dad should have played this part because yeah. who but dad would have a bowl of soup in a movie like in the late 60s? I think he's had bowls of soup that flashed red lights at him in real life. <laughs> um, and uh, then this, the... Uh, oh, this guy. Who was spectacular. This fellow, uh, is Walter Burke, Walter Burke, um, who's very diminutive. And so all of the FBR agents around him are also very diminutive. They have the scene where he's talking to them and they're all tiny and they've put him in the most immense chair and something I, I don't know if you noticed this, but I have never seen Walter Burke and Willem Dafoe in the same room at the same time. <laughs> um, <laughs> sort of uh, bizarre. And do I have any other photographs? Let's see. That might be the last one. That was the end of my photo array from this movie. Things that I just adored. Well, you know, if you look back at those pictures, you're going to see... Uh, you know, one of the things I love about the movie is is the way it's shot and its look. Uh, there was really beautiful film stock and cameras and lenses and stuff being used in the late 60s. And, you know, who shot this 
was uh, William Fraker, who's a great, great DP, did other movies like Bullet and Ooh. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and uh, a little movie called Rosemary's Baby, mm. which was actually a year after this movie. And you can really see like the way he shoots New York. You're, you can tell it's a really good example of, of kind of being able to, I think, feel a director photography style yes. because you can tell that's somehow connected to, uh, to Rosemary's baby and other movies shot by different crews wouldn't have the same feeling at all. Even in that same year, it would have been very different. So, you know what I should tell you and tell our studio audience that if you, um, Google uh, the president's analyst script PDF, and I'll put this in the comments. There's a wonderful uh, version of the script, uh, basically an illustrated script. It's the entire script and still frames from every scene throughout the whole movie. So it's really? an illustrated script. Yeah. I could you send that to me as well? I'd love yeah. to have that. Um, it's really it's terrific, and you get to see all of the stuff that we're we're describing in that PDF. Yeah, it's available uh, for free online. You know, w William Fraker uh, just brings like this crisp, incredibly crisp photography to this movie, and it it just looks outstanding. It really looks gorgeous. We saw a pretty good print of it too. Did you see it? Where did you see it? It was on Amazon. I saw it on on Amazon, yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty good print. Um, and uh, it, it's really it's really an eyeful. It looks great. Speaking of the cinematography, this movie has the earliest iteration that I can think of of the magic helicopter appearing shot that shows up later in blue thunder and in many movies it's where you hear the sound of the helicopter and you're waiting for it to show up from the sky and it rises up from behind something true that's really surprising true it's pretty surprising uh you, you didn't see a lot of crazy helicopter action in 1967 and uh that was surprising i will say as much as i love severin darden he did kind of screw that shot up a little bit um <laughs> and i can understand he doesn't seem to be the type to want to hang around helicopters like severin and helicopters don't look like they no. mix no although i got it candid to him he 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 was running around driving a boat like he did things in this movie I, you didn't think that you'd ever see severin darden do yeah wearing a wetsuit yeah that exactly <laughs> it was a surprise yeah um <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, I forget what I was even going to say about that. Oh, uh, oh, well, the helicopter shot, he does kind of, he kind of, he kind of screws up the take. Tip it. He doesn't, he doesn't respond. He, he, he's nervous clearly because this is a heavy take. They probably have one shot at this, you know, right. and, uh, he, he, uh, he has a weird delayed response to the helicopter. It's not, it's strange. Um, what were your favorite lines? I gave all my favorite lines. You know, we had the same ones. We had the same ones again? I mean, if I don't resume my analysis soon, I'm going to flip out. Is was my favorite, absolutely, by okay. barn on my favorite line. What um, about, this wasn't a line, but it was a great moment, was um, when Kropotkin, Severn Darden, starts talking about, you know, we have to implement Plan Rasputin, and he starts <laughs> describing it, and they have this great cut to to James Coburn looking like I don't understand what's going on and and Godfrey Cambridge gives him a look of like oh yeah he knows what he's talking about <laughs> uh I love like, oh plan Rasputin yeah <laughs> you know it does have a lot of in-laws DNA this movie it feels like it's got in-laws in it and um it was the same production designer art director Really? That's all I, I did know. Not pick that up. Did you hear the uh did you hear the Star Trek uh sound effects? I I read about that in trivia. I didn't notice it when I was watching the movie. You know who noticed it? Who? Amelia. Amelia noticed that? The minute it happened, she was like, Star Trek. And I was like, a beat behind her was like, Oh my god, you were totally wow. right about that. I yeah, believe, I was such a trekkie when I was a kid. I can't believe I didn't pick up on that. And it was on the elevator doors opening and closing. It was right. the same, like a same chirping thing. kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
So what she about, called it. Um, what about the Lalo Schifrin score? You know, uh, I'm a giant Lalo Schifrin fan. I have like, a, I follow Schifrin on Spotify. I've got Schifrin records. Love all of it. Not my favorite Schifrin score. No, no. I think he was trying to be, uh, trying to be funny where the score didn't need to be funny at all. Okay. I felt that was, you know, but I mean, he's Schifrin. So like, I mean, he's one of the greats, but it's did not score for bullet also. Yeah, I, I believe he did. Cause there's that, that, that flute score in the, in the uh, restaurant. I'll you know, tell you in one second, Schifrin, right? I, I'm going to say it's, it was Schifrin just because I, but I'm scared because we're live. And what if I'm wrong? What if, what if I'm wrong? wrong? What if I make a fool of myself? Do, do, do Lala Schifrin. Okay, good. Huh. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, and the list goes on uh, of, of Schifrin movies. I mean, we're talking, I mean, we're talking well, the Clancy movies. We're talking, you know, right. all the Dirty Harry stuff and then TV stuff, Man from Uncle. I mean, he was incredible. Do we need to talk about? Do we need to talk about any uh, racism in this movie? What I like. Well, I racism. think maybe somebody does. I don't know if we're qualified. Okay. Uh, well, I, I did notice. I did notice the racist. What I, the sequence that I call the racist chain of assassins. Yeah, was pretty. You know, racist. Well, and although they did subvert some of it. I mean, they'd be racist, but then they'd have like. You know, I mean, because, okay, they have a team of hit people from all over the world Every converging. Country, and it's all racial stereotypes. Well, in the sense that, you know, the, the there's a big um, uh, Chinese guy who's got, what does he, like, have, I forget, everybody has a weapon that's kind of, like, yeah. stereotypical. People from Africa have blow darts. But the funny part was, and the part that I felt was maybe commenting on that, was that they also all had business suits on. <laughs> so, that's true. They you all know. Th that them. was interesting. So he yeah. was he was this you know assassin from Africa with a blow dart, but he had a really natty, cool suit on with like a tie and a tight like beatnik style. So it was and interesting. Joan Darling's line about going into the city to have China yes, food. awful, so awful. But then so much a comment. It was so on purpose. I mean, it was it's shocking. But if you pay attention to the movie you at least see what they're trying to do. They're, yeah. they're making her, trying to make her look foolish as hell. Right. They're look, the suburb, those idiot suburban. Right. Because she's also going to like karate class karate and is class. wearing, you know, Asian clothes and is saying this. Yeah. She's completely out of touch. Yeah. So you kind of give it a pass for that. And also because I think the movie sets up this super, like it throws its hat into the ring as a left wing movie, like yeah. hardcore early very on. Very hardcore. Left so, I mean, I, I would be interested to see how, uh, how people feel about it today. I, there, there are things that are shocking, but I keep, but I kept on in, I, I kept on feeling like they make a case for them being, doing it on purpose to, to comment on the people that are racist, not on yeah. being racist, but yeah, again, not, not I'm not an expert. <laughs> um, there is a one moment. W one of my favorite moments is actually just a standalone thing because there's so many weird uh, tones in this film. But when that Canadian spy gets killed by the one of the short FBI FBR agents, yeah, he gets shot and he gets blown across the room, and they keep shooting him, and he keeps like sliding across the room more and more every time they hit it they, he gets shot that was yeah. that they, they did they weren't doing that in 1967 really like dirty dozen was maybe doing that right you know that was right. a really weird piece of like almost body horror violence that i was not expecting in this movie at all especially with a canadian exactly they don't deserve that they're nice they're um nice. How about some of the shots just like how about that helicopter shot from the top of the 
the, oh, from the top of the 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 uh, the, the liberty. I mean, the close up of him on the statue. It's of a dead, and, steady close up. Looks like it's on a tripod. Yeah, it's hovering in the sky. Just this close up of him on top of the Statue of Liberty, and it pulls back to see all of Manhattan. I mean, yeah, that was that's gorgeous. Cool. Gorgeous. William Fraker, man, he knew how to fly an helicopter. A little bit of the sequence in Harper where they have to do the the uh, Tororama tour guide book of of uh, yeah, exactly of the British Virgin of, Island or yeah, Cancun were. or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's do a travelogue of New York. <laughs> <laughs> They'll give us some money. We'll bring tourists in. Oh, I know oh, another line that oh, I liked. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Oh, we forgot somebody else who passed away this week. Theater, big, big person, not in theater, but for for us New York theater folk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe, Allen. Joe Allen. Yeah, I heard, I heard. I mean, that was how many sad. Nights have we sat at that bar? Oh, my God. Show? You know, it's funny. I was talking to my friends today. Um, uh, my friends Jacob and Trish, who um, I'm working on some writing you with, just and went to Sundance with. Yeah, I was at yeah, Sundance with them. Sundance, you're Jacob Sund and Trish, who you went to Sundance. Yeah, with week. yeah. And um, yeah, we were having a little writing, little writing session, and uh, I was telling them about that because it came up that Joe Allen had died and stuff, yeah. and we all all like Joe Allen the restaurant. We'd you know been there, and I was I was telling them about back in the day where you'd go to Joe Allen's to wait for the reviews to be in the physical newspapers. Yeah. And their mouths were hanging open. I mean, that was such a tradition for forever that the company would get together or the friends that were actors in a show would get together at the night of the opening and wait and drink and freak out until like two in the morning until the early editions of the papers would get released and yeah. everybody would rush out one person would rush out and get all the all the mags and bring it back to the bar and you'd all be hammered and going over the reviews and seeing if you were going to have a run or not yeah. and i know there's still reviews and everything but that you know tradition I mean? being gone now I know. It's so uh, sad you know i did a show once where we had two shows on saturday because it was a really sort of um alt downtown kind of show okay um it was well so you what like a two show two show saturday and sunday no two shows saturday but but two shows saturday night so we had a oh god and then like an 11 30 show that wouldn't be done until one o'clock was it a comedy at least yeah Okay. Um, it was a Charles Bush show. And we, the, the newspaper came out before we were off stage for the second show. Saturday. Oh my God. So they were handing us, and it was a rave review. Oh my God. So we, we took our curtain call, and as we walked off stage, the assistant stage manager was standing in the wing handing us the newspaper one at a time as we walked off stage saying, congratulations, you're in a hit. Congratulations, you're in a hit. And that's how we walked off stage. Is that nuts? That's nuts. That's really crazy. Yeah, all that stuff is gone. You know, it doesn't, I mean, yeah. even if theater ever it comes back ever again, that stuff yeah. has been gone anyway already. I remember theater. Yeah. So Joe Allen's, yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a uh, line I I found in my notes here uh, that I did like I love I love this I love the scene where we uh, we finally see it was the banana scene but it's the scene where where oh. Coburn finally psychoanalyzes Sever Darden he starts yeah. to analyze him and Sever Darden is like one of the most messed up human beings in the world like yeah. he works for the Russians you know intelligence his dad is the head of the foreign department of Russian intelligence so he's yeah. like born in but he'll never he you know and it turns out that his father had his mother killed for being an intellectual or something right, yeah and and um my mother was killed because she was an intellectual <laughs> who, who killed her my father my father her. of course <laughs> the mother dead in 1937 and he says oh i'm sorry and he just in the way that severin says no don't worry it's not your fault <laughs> it's yeah, just right. like great it was great Ah, uh, Christ. I'm very surprised Austin Pendleton isn't in this movie. He should be in this movie. He would have been. What great. is he not? Why doesn't he have a small part in this film? I don't know. 
Oh, the the line of of William Daniels when he shows that no decorator did it all herself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bill Daniels. I mean, if you ever need a Bill Daniels type, yeah, I hope you can get Bill Daniels because he yeah. is he is he's, fantastic, he is one of a kind. You remember him in Parallax View? No. Oh wow! Do you remember Parallax I've View? Seen Parallax View in a long. T- I remember the oh, last yeah. shot of Parallax View. And being really, really upset. It's upsetting. It's an upsetting movie. I, I, I love that film. I would, I would see that again. Any chance to see it again? Well, we could cover it. But uh, he's amazing in that movie too. He's kind of like, well, in a way, he's kind of like the deep throat of that movie. Yeah, um, he was something. He was something. So you know. Well. James yeah. Coburn, no, I don't, you know, uh, dude, I'm sorry. I love you, man. Flynn, like Flynn, great. Yeah. But, you but know. It's too bad. Okay, so, good, bad, good, bad, or bad, good? I'm going to say, uh, I think I'm, I'm going to say good, bad. Good, bad movie? Yeah. Yeah, me too. And uh, we can't say two great scenes and no bad ones, but we can say one great scene. We can say one one scene that is going to be one of my, like, it's going to be a scene I remember forever. I'm going to tell people about this scene. It's I think it's uh, incredible. I'm going to so, rip that scene and, and use it for my students. Um, I would love to read this script, too, because I have a feeling that it's a great read. Yeah. I, I, I have a feeling it, you know what? It also feels a little bit like just lest people get confused about the tone. Uh, if you, if you saw inherent vice, like PT Anderson's take on kind of uh, the hippie scene and, and the 70s, like early seventies LA. Yeah. Um, it has a similar kind of insane quality to it. It's, it's pretty nuts. Um, but a lot of fun stuff in it. And I'd say worth seeing. Definitely. Yeah, I think definitely hang in there because if you, if you start lagging a little bit, know that the end wraps up in a way that's completely amazing considering current events. Like it, it presages some things that'll blow your mind. Yeah. Actually, speaking of which this ties into another line. That's really notable. Love it. Uh, Severn Darden, James Coburn outside at that phone booth in the middle of nowhere in the, in the countryside. Yeah. And um, they're, they can't get the phone to work, which is a big plot point of the movie. And um, Coburn says, Oh, God damn phone company. I hate the phone company. And Severn Darden goes, everybody hates the phone company everywhere. I've been all over the world. Everybody hates their phone company. He says, Bedouins hate their phone company. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That was pretty good. All right. So um, that wraps up our four weeks of presidential movies. President isn't in this movie. So it's not really a president movie anymore. No. Oddly. I I forgot that there was actually no president in the. Forgive me. I was seven years old the last time. You should have known. Yeah. Um, But next week we're going to be discussing a movie called blast of silence which was recommended to me by a friend um and uh anthony you have seen it yes i have not uh but i'm gonna watch it this week but it's not really available anyway it's in the criterion collection is that right it is but i don't know if it's still in print in the criterion collection i have an old copy of it um so you have the DVD from the the Criterion Collection. I have a DVD of it. Yeah, I still because I still one of those old, but old creepy guys available. that collects media. Yeah, but it's not available anywhere. But we're gonna watch it and we're gonna talk about it anyway. So we hope is it not? Will. Let's let me. Can I quickly just see Blast of Silence? I'll, I'll I will uh, while you're doing that, so that you know for the podcast there's still some sound. I'll just sing. Um, I'll sing along to uh, joy to the should all acquaintance be 
for dashing all of Lash- lalo schifrin's yes all of lalo schifrin's holiday music for the summertime shots in the president's analyst don't understand what that musical sequence was about at all um well blast of silence is available on um dvd only available on dvd only okay uh i believe so well you know once we've talked about it they can close the book our following of hundreds of thousands of people will be clamoring for it uh, when we're done talking about it i can tell you it's worth trying to get a hold of yeah you know i mean the beginning of our we're going to do a who knows how many in a row but we're going to start doing a little streak of noir which is a great name streak of noir streak of noir that's the movie that followed blast of silence exactly streak Streak of of noir right um so, I'm into it. I'm. So, I think there's no reason why I can't do three, maybe four of these. But uh, you know, okay. well, cool. Um, well, we're very excited, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks, uh, everybody. A like, follow us on YouTube, subscribe to us on your podcast, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Be safe. Be well. Good night, Hi, buddy. Wait, how do I end this thing? Uh, It's not ending.